make it make it work. Anyway, uh, la last week, the key ingredient was, especially in the hour that we're living in, especially that the hour that we're living in. Okay? If you don't think you're living in a special hour, I got news for you. You've never come to a season like this season in God before. Never been there. I've been here 35 years, and I've never seen a season like this season. I've been on the planet for 82 years. I've never seen a thing like this thing. I've been a baseball fan ever since the days of Hal Newhouser. So everybody's looking at me like a mule looking at a new gate to say, who was he? He was the best left-handed pitcher that the Tigers ever had. And that was in the middle 40s. Say, well, how old were you? I was about four or five years old when I started listening to baseball. Don't say he's watching it because we didn't have anything to watch with. I got to watch this big old radio we had, this Philco, big Philco box in our, our living room. And, and I loved baseball. I've loved baseball since I was this big. But never did I ever see them, even through the first or the second world war. And for most of you have no idea what the second world war really was. I mean, uh, through the war, they never stopped playing baseball. But as of this afternoon, they stopped playing baseball. For all of us, total sports freaks, there's no basketball Ronnie to watch. There's not even March Madness this year. There's no more hockey to watch. And the cocky guy who said, I'm not afraid of this thing, they found out he's got it. He plays for the Utah Jazz. All that jazz caught up with him. I've never seen a se time like this. I've never seen a season like this. And I have to be honest with you, I never heard really clearly from the Lord that this was more than just some kind of thing, some kind of thing, and the typical political aspect is never, never let a tragedy or anything like that go by without you can use it to your advantage politically. That's what it looked like it started, but it looks like exactly what our president said. It doesn't care what party you're in. You can get it. Okay? And no matter where you go, it's, it's there. And we're living in a time uh, when we need to speak the words of the Lord. And the seventh trumpet said, this is what has to be declared. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. But before they're ever going to become the Lord and his Christ out there, they're going to come here. You say, I am got any nations up there. You've got a lot of imaginations. Because I can tell how people get wound up emotionally when they over things that are just going their way. And it's always God. You know, I'm, you know, when it's just what you want and it's always, and it's going your way, it's always God, you know, or God told me. I, I've been there, and I'm not going to argue with anybody. When, they, when somebody tells me, God told me, I'm not going to argue with them. Because if God told them, 
It's, it's like David said, you know. He said, the Lord said to my Lord. You've got to be able to discern which Lord is which. Yeah, have you got the picture? And so we're living in a season. We're living in a time where we're going to have to declare that the kingdoms of this age, this world, have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. But there's also another voice speaking in direct opposition. And I, I think we're just being bombarded by this thing. You've got to... You've got to uh, you got to watch and listen very carefully. So be careful. Because here is the result. I want to read verse 18 of chapter 11 before I move forward, okay? I want to back up one. And the nations were angry. Guess what? When all the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he starts to take over, there's going to be a much of angry people. I think there's going to be a bunch of angry believers because things aren't going just the way they thought. Yes. And, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged. Say, God, has got more into this than just people who are walking on the planet. That thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. Let me tell you, destroying the earth isn't chemicals. It isn't acid rain. It isn't a smoky car. It isn't all of this stuff. What's destroying is people who deny the creator of it. Now you got that? And that doesn't mean that, that uh, you're going to escape anything. You're going to go through it. Can I, can, can, can I, uh, can I, can I preach and teach a little bit? Let me turn to Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 17. Remember the story uh, in chapter 17, uh, Paul was in Athens, and he said uh, he was going through Athens and Greece, and he was looking around. And he said to them, he said, oh, you know, he said, you guys are pretty religious here. You're a real spiritual group. The fact is, you even got an idol over there that you worship. That's called to the unknown God. Have you got that? I bet you everyone in this room has got a couple of your own. And you just don't recognize. Okay, first, let me, let me start reading uh, uh, maybe verse 23. For as I was passing through and considering the object of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. For God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all, not just some, 
He gives to all. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. He gives to all life, breath, and all things. That's good things, bad things, and everything. God's over it all. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed time and the boundaries of their dwellings. So God knew what race you were going to be. God knew who your mom and dad were going to be. God knew where you were going to live. He knew where you, who you were going to marry. He knew how many kids you were going to have. And thank God he gives you grandkids. And great grandkids. Are you all right? So that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he be not far from each one of us. For now listen to this. Listen to this. He's talking after after Pentecost, after the outpouring of the Spirit. So listen to this. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's uh, device. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooks, but now he commands all men. Say, how many? Everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day. Say, say, appointed day. You can't get away from that. He's appointed a day. We're just looking at this, this day, here in Revelation. That day is when the trumpet blows and there's a declaration that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And in that day, not only are God's people going to be connected to the Lord because they'll overcome all things, but they're also got a job to do. Are you all right? Listen to this. Because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness in the man. Who's the man? The Christ man. In the man. The world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Isn't that amazing how he said that? The corporate man's going to do the judging, but the top man, the head of the man, we're included in him already right there. Can't get away from it. Okay? So those that destroy the earth are going to have to be dealt with, and it's got to be done by the man. And you can't show partiality because they're your nephew, your kid, your sister, your cousin, your uncle. There's no partiality. You've got to go by the word of the Lord, the direction of the Lord. Okay? I didn't want to cover all of that, but I think it's time we begin to understand what God's got in store. Okay? So now, you want to move to chapter 12? Well, I don't think you can move to chapter 12 until you fully understand Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Most of the older theologians believe that 1119 should be the title to chapter 12. Because it's a wonderful thought. The seventh trumpet is sounded. There's no more trumpets. 
the purpose for the seventh trumpet has been sounded and declared. That's what's going to be the done in the next seven or so years of this decade. And the verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. Say, heaven's not a place. It's a realm. It's a state of being. It could be a place that you want to look at in the spirit. But looking from a natural place, you can't make a place for it. Because I got, I got a question to ask you. Is heaven bigger than God so that he dwells in it? Or is God bigger than heaven and it dwells in him? Because God is what? Spirit. He doesn't, he doesn't have time. In only one time did he have time or space as in Jesus the Christ. Okay? Are we all here? Have I got your attention? Okay. So in the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple where is his temple? Didn't Paul write and say, don't you know you are the temple of God? Don't you know? You're God's dwelling place. I know how I was taught. I knew how I was brought up. But once I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I got an understanding who God is, I began to realize God doesn't dwell in anything but people. And he's pretty choosy about how he lives in people. were seen in his temple the Ark of the Testament. Okay. And there were the Ark of his Testament, there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. I want to tell you when, when God is fully expressed in a people there's going to be a whole lot of shaking going on. J. Lou Lewis is going to be singing again. There's going to be a whole lot of shaking going on. There's going to be a whole lot of stuff going on that you and I never expected would happen. Now I want to talk a little bit, just a little bit, about this because I'm already 10 after. So let me see. We found out where his dwelling was. It's Naos, the temple of God, always was intended to be in mankind. That's why he formed Adam out of the dust. And Adam was still spirit. He was still in God. So then he breathed in him the breath of lies, natural and spiritual. Are you all right? God wanted to live in man. He wanted to live in what he created. He don't want to live in what you create. Okay. It's the place of God's dwelling. The ark. Let's, t let's talk about the literal ark. Because really... The little, literal ark was not a place of God's dwelling. It was symbolic. Moses went with God up in the mount. And God took him into visions of the purpose of God. And 
told Moses, you go down and you build it down there. Exactly the same thing that he told Job. He took Job up and made him look at the stars. He said, do you see that Maseroth up there? He said, can you make that down there on the earth, Job? He said, what's a Maseroth? If you really understood the heavens and the stars, it's God's man in the heavens. It controls everything. So he brought it down, he started making the ark. The first thing he made the ark out of was shittim wood. How many have ever studied what shittim wood? Gopher wood, yeah. You got a little piece and then you go for another one. You got a little piece and you go for another one. And, you know, I know, I know, I know what it is, but it, it's a wood that grows in the desert. And it doesn't rot. Termites can't eat it. They chew on it, they lose their teeth. Nothing can rot it. Water don't rot it, it doesn't rot. It's shit em wood. Plus it's so small, when they put it together under pressure, it stays together without glue. The ark was a box of shit em wood. And then it was clothed with gold. Inside and out. And gold speaks of the divine nature of the Lord. And because it speaks of mankind. Shittim wood speaks of you and me and mankind. And the gold speaks of divine nature, being covered with divine nature. With a mercy seat, solid gold on the top. But inside was the important thing. These were the characteristics of what it represents. In it was two tables of stone with the laws written on it. Isn't that what he said? The first commandment was written on stone. But he said the second covenant, I'm not going to write it on stone. I'm going to write it on the inside. And so the representation was the two stones were put in the ark. Secondly, the manna, that was the supply of the Lord, the daily supply, every day the supply. But what's amazing about once it was put in, in the ark, you know what it was called? It was called the hidden manna. Say in me, if I'd ever wake up, is the supply of the Lord. And the third thing that was in there was Aaron's rod that budded. And if you understand the Aaron's rod, remember what happened? Aaron went down to Egypt and he cast his rod down and it turned into a snake. And all the magicians of, of Egypt went down and threw their rods down and they turned into snakes. But Aaron's snake ate up all their snakes. And then it turned back into a rod. And Aaron put it in his hand. And the best thing was it was a staff of an almond tree. The almond tree was the first fruit that came ripe in Israel. 
came in January. It was called the first fruit, the first ripe fruit. And that, those three items were in the ark. We began to realize that God has put everything within the man, including himself. Help me, Jesus. Say, when you open up the temple of God, you're going to see things. Guess what? The battery just went dead. If you were as old as this thing, your battery go dead too. Jesus. Okay. Let's go to chapter 12. We okay? I got 15 minutes. I don't think I'm going to get uh, verse 5, but I might. Okay. That's okay. I want to say something about chapter 12 before I begin to read. Uh, I, I have to say, the other day, my pastor, my, my pastor that began to teach me how to study and do all of that back in the 60s, uh, Brother Sexton was a great student of the book of Revelation. And uh, he enlightened us to a writer, a man by the name of G.H. Lang. Yeah who he said had the greatest revelation of the book of Revelation when it come to kingdom of order. And one of the things I found out over the years of reading G.H. Lang's book of Revelation, which I read probably five or six times, the fact is, if I wouldn't have been uh, trying to write down some stuff today, and I'll probably start digging through my cupboard to see where it is so I can read it again. But uh, the picture of chapter 12 is this. The one thing I've discovered over the years, in chapter 12, there are three groups of people. There's a woman, okay, there's a man child. And in verse 17, there's the remnant of her seed. And I have to say, in the seasons when I grew up, every time you see the word remnant, you thought maybe they were the overcomers because we kind of related. You, you, you understand? You got to understand conversation and how teachings go. But I come to a realization, maybe 15, 18 years ago, that the word remnant in this case means that which is left over, or the remaining ones. So you got a group of people called the woman, and you got a group of people called the man child, okay? And you come down and you find the remnant of her seed. It means that's what's left over. And I came to the realization that remnant doesn't mean small. It means probably more than the other two groups put together. Okay? And some, some people are going to say, how did you get all of that? Well, maybe 25 years of study and understanding and reading and listening to the voice of the Spirit, okay? Now, I know all the traditional teaching. I have this wonderful Bible that's called the Spirit-Filled Bible, okay? But what's amazing to me 
there's two lines of eschatology in this Bible, and both of them supposedly are spirit-filled. Okay, there's traditional, and there's dispensational. And 90% of Christendom follows the dispensational theory. Are you listening to me? Okay. So, uh, so if I want the traditional understanding, all I got to do is read what's right down here, where it says dispensational interpretation. I, I don't have any problem doing that. But I don't believe any of it. Well, I don't believe a lot of it. Let's put it that way. Chapter 12. Where are we at? Chapter 12, verse 1, the seventh trumpet, okay, it sounded. Are we, are we all set? The temple in heaven is open. And so we're going to get another vision. Oh, I got to say something else about chapter 12. Chapter 12 was kind of like a parenthesis. You know, you're trying to explain something, okay? And you got a little thought you want to add in, so you make a parenthesis. So the whole chapter is like a parenthesis. <coughs> I heard someone say that chapter 12 in the book of Revelation is the reader's digest of the whole book. How many ever read the Reader's Digest? No, some of you are too young for the Reader's Digest. It's just a little condensed version of the whole book of Revelation from 1-1 to 21, or 2221. okay? So let's begin with chapter 12. I got seven minutes to open it up. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. Where is it? In the same place the opening of the temple was. A great sign appeared in heaven and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Now, if I was to follow the dispensational theory, they're going to tell me that was the church of the old covenant. Because they can only see the man child as Jesus. Are you listening to me? I'm not denying he's an integral part, but it's a corporate, it's the corporate Christ by the time you get to this point. Because you've got to go all the way back to the first five words in the book of Revelation. This is the unveiling of Jesus the Christ. That's the whole thing. Jesus the man, the God man, the Christ man was unveiled when he walked on the shores of Galilee. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon was under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Okay? First thing I want to talk about is the word great wonder. The word wonder means a sign or a miracle. If I look around, If I look around at the church world today, it'd be a miracle if it ever come to the quality of what they're talking about this woman is. She's clothed with the sun. And the moon is under her feet. She's in perfect light. 
And to be in perfect light, she's in perfect life, bud. First John said, and so did the gospel, says God is light. In him is no darkness at all. And uh, John, the gospel says, and he was life, and it was the light of men. Are you all listening? She's clothed with the sun, and the moon is under her feet. Let, I got a couple of minutes. Let me, let me turn to a couple of verses. Um, let me see. Well, 116. Revelation 1, 116. We know the story here. Um, it was describing the one in the midst of the churches, in the midst of the lampstands. And verse 16 says, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance, say the countenance, was like the sun shining in its strength. One translation, I think it's a Phillips, says, brighter than the noonday. Isn't that amazing? He's not talking about Jesus. And now they're talking about this church that's clothed with the sun. Chapter 10, verse 1. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had the book. He had the little book. Remember John had to eat the book? But this is the best one. Song of Solomon. i got to find Song of Solomon. It's back here someplace. Somebody help me. Okay, Song of Songs, come on. Come up there. Why did that happen? Psalms. Ecclesiastes. Okay, Song of Solomon. Chapter 6. Okay. And uh, this is under the, I don't know about you, anybody ever studied the Song of Solomon, the most beautiful love story there ever was, you know? But this is the beloved. And he's looking for his sweetheart. Verse 4. Oh, my love, you are beautiful as Tezroth. Lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me. Yeah, right, don't do that to me. <laughs> For they have overcome me. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing. Every one bears twins, and none is barren among them, like a piece of pomegranate. Boy, I mean, this guy can pour it on. And your temples behind your veil. There are 60 queens and eight concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Listen to this. Who is she who looks forth as the morning star. You all know what the morning star is, don't you? It's the rising of the sun. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. What's he talking about? He's talking about his beloved. 
This is a picture of this one here in Revelation. And I'm telling you, help me, Jesus. You know, it used to be years ago, people used to say to me, what's your vision, Pastor? What's your vision, Pastor? How could I explain my vision when most people were still struggling with Pentecost? When you begin to realize that God can raise a people, her clothed with the sun, a church, a company of people that are clothed with the sun. The moon is under their feet. You want to know what the crown of 12 stars is? I haven't got time, but I can take you back into the book of Revelation. Brother Steve, listen to Brother Steve. Right now he's, he's teaching on the 12 gates. Okay? But you know what? If you just go back and read the gospel, Jesus told his disciples that they would be the gates, not the Old Testament saints. They would be the ones. The 12. There's a church in this hour that God's raising up. I, I'm going to stop here because it's 830. There's a church. I have a dream. That this church becomes like her. This church becomes like her. Did you ever try to go out? How many have ever seen the eclipse of the sun? I did. I remember when they had it, they said you can't look at it. You can't look at it with your sunglasses. I remember when the eclipse of the sun was, I had to run to the garage and get my welder's glasses to take a look at it. Can you imagine a church so bright, clothed with the sun, brighter than the noonday? Is it any wonder Paul got struck to the ground? Couldn't see for days? Are you all listening? I'm going to stop here, but I'm going to read verse 2. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Say God has had in his bride the cry of a son. If you want to understand it, go back and study Hannah. When she went before Eli, she never cried out just for a baby. She cried for a son. Say, God help us to become like this woman and put the cry within us for the whole creation groans and travails for the manifestation, not just to have a son, but for the sons of God to manifest. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To manifest. And the next verse says, and we also groan. Groan. To produce what God is after. I love you guys. 
Don't get caught up in all this crazy fear junk. It is serious. You can't go into denial. It's real. Don't tempt the Lord. But walk in faith. Amen. 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 Father, I just thank you for this people. I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this word. Father, hopefully it ministers in the heart of people, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Nikita, when you get done up there, I need to talk to you. Uh, Peter, Peter.